Our speaker this evening received his PhD in World Religions and World Church from the Theology Department at the University of Notre Dame, and a master's in China Studies at the Henry M. Jackson School at the University of Washington. Dr. John Lindblom has studied the Catholic Church in China for over 20 years, has worked and studied in mainland China, and conducted research in Taiwan and Hong Kong. His research and publication topics include the work of Chinese scholar of law and Bible translator John C.H. Wu, human rights and re recent challenges fake facing Catholics in China. Please welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture for the first time, Dr. John Lindblom. Yeah, good to have you, doctor. Great. Well, thank you very much. And it's great to see everybody. I see a few people and I see a bigger number down below. So Thank you for having me, and it's a pleasure to be here and to uh, step in for my good friend Anthony Clark. And I, and I guess uh, many of you have heard him before, and you know what an incredible lecturer and an incredible scholar he is. I recommend his uh, videos and books to you. He's written many excellent books about the Catholic Church in China. Perhaps the one most relevant to tonight's topic is called China's Saints. And I don't have an image for, for you, but uh, you can remember that title. And that is an excellent book, um, mostly focused on um, saints and martyrs from China in the Qing Dynasty period, which is from the 17th century until the uh, beginning of the 20th century. This evening, what I would like to share is some of the highlights of Catholic mission and evangelization history in China. And starting from the earliest time, which is the 7th century AD until, um, until the 20th century, but I will, I will save the, the second half of the 20th century, which is basically the period under the Communist Party rule in China. I'm going to save most of that for the next lecture, and you'll see the, the title and everything uh, for that later, because that, in that lecture, I'll deal with the, the situation um, as regards the official church or the above ground church and the underground church. And that's one of the most common questions that anybody who studies the Catholic Church in China gets all the time is what's, what's going on? What's the situation with the underground church and the official church? And it's a natural question because we read and hear lots of things and a lot has happened. But I'll save most of that for the next lecture, do a whole lecture on that topic. And today will be kind of all of the background leading up to that. So to jump right in, the first Christian mission uh, to China in recorded history was in the seventh century in the year 635, where according to a stone monument uh, erected in the or erected in the city of Xi'an in China in the year seven, okay. In the year 781, the stone monument was created, but it refers back to the year 635 when uh, a Syrian missionary and his cohort, Syrian monks from the Church of the East, uh, and the monk on the, on the, it's called the Nestorian Stele, I'll explain that in a second. His name in Chinese on the monument is Aloban, and so that has been westernized as Alopen, um, and that's the only record of his name, so we don't really know his, his original Western name. But uh, here's a, an artistic rendering of him. He's the, the man in red right near the middle. And he's um, visiting, uh, translating as the Tibetan ambassador uh, receives him. So this is a, an early painting in 641. And then the next two slides uh, show the, this, this slide is called, popularly called the Nestorian Stele. The Stele is a stone monument. It's very tall. Uh, I don't know, it's over 10 feet tall, 10 to 15 feet tall. And uh, I'll, I'll show you the top on the next slide, but this, all of the smaller writing underneath, underneath the heading, all of that is Chinese, most of that is Chinese text that describes this mission from the Syrian Church of the East to China. So it describes who this monk was and what they preached and where they went and, and a lot of information about their mission. And this is one of the only records of their mission in history. So this monument has been extensively studied by, by many people for many years. And then on the very bottom is actually Syrian writing. So that, that's of great interest to historians too. 
So the, on the, the yellow text on the side I've written there on its heading in traditional Chinese are the words Da Qing Jing Jiao Liu Xing Zhong Guo Bei. And then the translation, stay lay to the propagation of China of the luminous religion of Da Qin. Those first two characters, Da Qin, is, is the name they gave to the Roman Empire from which these missionaries came. And the next two characters, Jing Jiao, is, is luminous doctrine. That's what, or luminous religion. That's what they referred to. That's how the Chinese who, who drew this up uh, referred to their religion, which was Christianity. So the next slide shows the top of that stele. And you can see, um, you can see it's a beautiful, beautifully carved monument. Um, and uh, you can see those characters I just read announcing what is the topic of this monument. And the figures at the top, I, I, don't, I don't know off the top of my head now what those figures represent, but they're certainly of significance to their mission and their doctrine. And then, so that was the first mission. It lasted for, um, for a couple of hundred years, uh, and then it kind of died out. And then the second wave of evangelization in China was, was the first actual Catholic monks or Catholic uh, missionaries who were Franciscans. And so the first Catholic church so those earlier monks established some monasteries, and they were from the Syrian Church of the East, which event, which, which was under the um, control of the Bishop Nestorius at the time, so that's why they get called Nestorians. But they didn't actually, you know, if you've studied the history of Christology, you know that Nestorius's Christology was eventually condemned by the church, but they didn't see themselves as preaching, you know, Nestorius's view of Christ, they just saw themselves as preaching Christ. And Actually, um, I have a I can I have a short quote from them. So they had there was an early uh, early in their time uh, versus later in their time. There's a difference of opinion among scholars about the kind of the degree of their orthodoxy. So in one of their earlier works, they wrote a book. They published a book called The Book of Jesus the Messiah. And here's a quote from it. You'll recognize some of these terms, and then you'll see in another sense that some of these terms. Are familiar, but they're, 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 they're given in a different way than we're familiar with. So here's the quote from, the, from that mission, the Syrian Church of the East. Human beings do evil behind the back of the heavenly Lord and turn away from him. However, having seen all this, the heavenly Lord still has abundant mercies. He admonished them to do good, but they followed their own will and disobeyed the heavenly Lord. The heavenly Lord sent the cool wind in Chinese, Liangfeng, which is the Holy Spirit, entered into the womb of Mo Yen, Mary, so that all should see this conception without a man. Let all men in the world see this and proclaim the heavenly Lord has power. So that was one of their ways to introduce who Jesus was. And then one scholar wrote that uh, years later, they sort of, it, adopted uh, ideas, more ideas from Taoist doctrines, and kind of obscured uh, the Christian doctrines, and the passion story of Jesus is virtually ignored, and the historical Jesus is depicted as an ascetic practitioner of the way of salvation and an enlightened preacher. And then a third point that, that scholars pull out is that perhaps due to Manichaean influence, the cross is reduced to merely to a mere symbol and salvation comes about through enlightenment or gnosis attained through correct personal training. So it seems that those Syrian monks, some of them later on, sort of veered, veered off, of the, uh, off of the path of Orthodox Christology. Um, then, sorry, then I get to, now we get to the Franciscans. In 1294, the first Catholic church is established in China by the Italian Franciscan friar Giovanni de Monte Corvino, or John of Monte Corvino. And uh, he lived from 1247 to 1328, and he became China's first Catholic bishop and built his cathedral in 1299 in the city that is now Beijing. And that mission uh, in, lasted until about 1368, when the Yuan Dynasty collapsed and the Catholic faith was forbidden in China. And so the Catholic Church, uh, as Dr. Clark, according to Dr. Clark's research, disappeared in East Asia. And then the third wave, let's say, of Catholic missions 
was the most famous, and that was the Jesuits who arrived in China um, in the late 1500s. The most famous of these Jesuits, of course, as many of you will know, is Matteo Ricci. Uh, but there were a whole group of really amazing Jesuits who, who either accompanied Ricci or came after Ricci. Uh, Ferdinand Verbiest, Adam Schall von Bell, uh, Michel Ruggieri. There's a, lar a fairly large group of Jesuits, but Ricci is the most famous and, and he was truly an astonishing person in Catholic mission history. He was among, among these Jesuits, he learned and mastered the Chinese language and probably was the first Westerner to ever write books in Chinese. And, um, and he and his and the other Jesuits he was working with, they, they, they took an approach to mission that was not common at the time. Um, mission efforts at that time, especially in Asia, were more accompanied, were, were kind of supported by the political powers, maybe of Spain or of Portugal, and they kind of saw the idea of, of subjecting and converting a whole nation uh, to Christianity. And, and they realized through their work in Japan and China that that would not work in East Asia. These were already very culturally advanced societies. They already had a rich uh, literature and philosophy. And so they, they took the approach that the Jesuits have become famous for throughout history, which is uh, finding God in all things and, tr and trying to look for where God is already present in the culture where they're, where they're working. And so Ricci, his first book in Chinese was called On Friendship. So he wrote a, he took the Europe, you know, European philosophers and their ideas about friendship. And since he had learned Chinese and had started to read the Chinese classics, and he spent a good, you know, I don't know how many years, 10, 15, 20 years learning Chinese and reading the Chinese classics. Um, you know, he found that Chinese philosophers had a lot to say about friendship. So he wrote this book kind of comparing them. Uh, and it was a, it was a very popular in China. It sold out. And, you know, most Chinese scholars had never met or read anything by a Westerner before. And he, so he started by laying this groundwork, talking about friendship. And uh, so he won himself a, a lot of admiration. And then his, uh, his most famous work about Christianity is called Tian Zhu Shi Yi, the true meaning of the Lord of heaven. And so uh, the Chinese word Tian means heaven. And the Chinese word Zhu means Lord. So he put those, well, he borrowed that term. It was already existed in Chinese as Tian Zhu, the Lord of heaven. And the, the Chinese concept of heaven was already very well developed. So Ricci took this term Tian Zhu and he said, now I'm going to show you more about what this term means. So he wrote this book, The True Meaning of the Lord of Heaven. And, um, he took what is could, what what could be called a, a scholastic approach, um, meaning that he was trying to find similarities between Christian teaching and Confucianism. Now that process alone took a long time because the Jesuits initially made contact with Buddhists in China, and they thought that following Buddhism and dressing like Buddhists would be the way to go. But after some years, they rejected that idea, and they they. They, they basically rejected Buddhism and said, this is, not, this is not at all the way to go. And they realized that China was really ruled by Confucian scholars. And so they learned Confucianism and dressed as Confucian scholars and, and, and sought to find the similarities between the teachings of Confucius and Christianity, of which there were many similarities to build on. Um, in particular, Confucianism emphasizes order and emphasizes the five great relations in society. Um, between heaven and the king and husband and wife and the king, uh, the ruler and the subject and between brothers and uh, brothers and uh, fathers and brothers and elder brothers and younger brothers. So, um, so Ricci built on all of this precedented material in, uh, in Confucius. And he borrowed these terms to introduce concepts. So he took that term Tianju and that became uh, the term by which he referred to God. Um, but that wasn't the only term. There was debate at the time, and, and believe it or not, even until today, not all Christians in China uh, agree on the same term for God, although Tianju became the official Catholic term for God. So, so the Catholic faith in China is called Tianju Jiao, the doctrine of the Lord of Heaven. But Protestants 
uh, when their missionaries got to China, they argued over the terms for God too. And they actually, they're, even to this day, there's difference among Protestant groups over what's the proper term for God. Many of them use the term Shangdi, which means the highest God. Um, and, but that also has other meanings in Chinese history. And some of them use the term Shun, which means God or deity or spirit. Uh, that's a, and so um, there are books and papers and volumes written. This is called the term question. What is the proper term for God? But Catholics are settled on that now but it wasn't always that way historically. Um, Ricci, okay, and, and this was, Ricci made a statement in a letter back to his Jesuit superior about his strategy of mission and evangelizing. Ricci wrote in 1596, we only venture to move forward very slowly. It is true that up till now we have not explained the mysteries of our holy faith, but we are nonetheless making progress by laying the principal foundations, God creator of heaven and earth, the immortal soul, the judgment given to the good and the bad. All these things were unknown to them up till now, and they did not believe in them. And so uh, that was what uh, a scholar has called pre-evangelical dialogue. And then later they... Um, they get to they get to preaching Christ, um, and initially Ricci didn't mention much about the death and resurrection of Christ because he 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 believed that the Chinese would have would still have a difficult time with the idea that God could become a man. First of all, that didn't seem to to most Chinese like something that that the Almighty God would do, and then. Uh, that he would die like a criminal also seemed unthinkable to many Chinese. So Ricci thought it's going to have to take some time to explain why this makes sense. Um, nevertheless, uh, Ricci's Tianzhu Shiyi was extremely influential in, in getting Chinese readers to be open and receptive to Christianity. And, uh, and Ricci... Uh, he discusses Christ briefly in the last chapter of that book, but he's nevertheless credited with converting some of the high-level scholar elite, most notably Xu Guangqi, Xu Guangqi a Jinshu degree holder, uh, which is the highest position in imperial China. And I think the next picture is of Ricci. Yeah, this is Ricci and Xu Guang, Paul Xu Guangqi. Um, and, and Xu Guang, as a Jinshu degree holder, that meant he was, he had passed the highest, or he had gotten the highest score on the imperial examination and was a high level scholar official in China. So his conversion to the Catholic faith had a huge impact on, on his family, uh, the, uh, the, all of his descendants became Catholics and he had a granddaughter in particular who became very influential in evangelizing Chinese and, um, and even to this day, Chinese Catholics revere him. And one of the biggest Chinese Catholic publishing houses today is named after him, Guangqi, Guangqi Press. I think it's, in, based, it's either based in Taiwan or Hong Kong now. Um, and then there were a couple of other high-level Chinese converts um, that became known as the three pillars of the Catholic Church in China. And I think that's the next picture. Uh, yeah, that's this one. And so Xu Guangqi is one of this group, and then Li Zhizhao and Yang Tingyun. So these three were, were high-level uh, elites, uh, educated leaders, degree holders. Um, the Jesuits never achieved their goal of actually baptizing or converting the emperor, but um, I'll, I'll get to the emperor in a second. The next, but the, the previous slide, one we just skipped, is another Jesuit who had great success in introducing Christ in China. His name was Giulio Alleni, another Italian. So among these early Jesuits, uh, the Italians were the ones who, who, well, there were others, there were Germans and some people from some other countries, but the Italians showed great creativity. Um, and uh, Giulio Alleni wrote uh, a catechism and he, um, and he, it, here's a translation of part of Eleni's text, um, introducing the, the Christian story, why God would send his son and, and save the world in this way. 
uh, Alini wrote, when one's virtue of love is so very deep, the way one loves would be equally profound. As a gentle, loving mother nurtures her child, she would hold him and embrace him and bathe him all by herself. There would be no mention of the mother being disrespectful. Um, sorry, this, this, question, this answer is particularly in response to the question of how God could humble himself to become a human being, the incarnation. The emperor dwells in the ninth sky. If he sees his beloved son suddenly fall into the pond, would he not rescue his son immediately himself? instead of being concerned about diminishing himself and waste time to shout for his left and right subordinates to help, the Lord of heaven's love for humankind is very much like the loving, gentle mother's love for her beloved child. Humankind's being engulfed in sins is no less an emergency than someone who is about to drown. Sins should not be left uncleansed. The wor world should not be left unsaved. How could he have stopped himself from becoming incarnate? What's more is that the whole mission of salvation of the world for the redemption of the sins of tens of thousands of generation is not within the capacity of any holy persons. Hence, no one else can take his place. So that you can get a very clear picture there. And this also corresponds with um, St. Thomas Aquinas and some of his writings on the fittingness of the incarnation. Aquinas wrote quite a bit about this question, whether it was fitting that God would be, should become a man. Um, so Ricci and the other Jesuits, they, they also won themselves favor with the emperors by introducing um, European sci science, mathematics, and astronomy, and that won them positions in the court of the, um, of the emperor. And I think the next slide might be the, um, the Kangxi emperor, um, or one of the next two. And so this is the Kangxi emperor, and he, he listened very carefully to the Jesuits. He read Ricci's treatises, and he issued an edict of toleration for Christianity. He believed that their doctrine was good and positive, and he gave Ricci uh, a, an official permission to build a Catholic church in Beijing. And, and the site of that church is still there in Beijing, or it is the site currently of the South Cathedral in Beijing. There are four cathedrals in Catholic cathedrals in Beijing. And so uh, the, the site of the South Cathedral is where uh, Ricci built uh, the first Catholic, his first Catholic church there. Um, and the first in 1685, the first Chinese priest, Gregory Luo Wenzhou, uh, became a Dominican priest and became the first uh, Catholic bishop, uh, first Catholic priest in China. He never became a full bishop, but he came, became an apostolic administrator. Uh, in, 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 he was ordained priest in 1654 and then bishop or apostolic administrator in 1685. Um, then in 1692 is when the Emperor Kangxi uh, published the Edict of Toleration of Christianity and said, all temples dedicated to the Lord of Heaven in whatever place they may be found ought to be preserved and that it may be permitted to all who wish to worship this God to enter these temples, offer him incense, and perform ceremonies practice according to ancient custom by the Christians. Therefore, let no one henceforth offer them any opposition. So that a strong statement of, of tolerance and support for the Christians. Later, that changed because the, Dominican, uh, the, the Jesuits got into disagreements with the Dominicans and the Franciscans over the question of whether or not uh, Chinese people who became Christians could continue to practice the rites of ancestor veneration and veneration of Confucius that were traditional for Chinese families. The Jesuits uh, came, to, came to, say, to conclude that these right, it was okay for Chinese to keep doing these rites. They do not amount to worshiping the ancestors. They just amount to reverence and performing a civic duty. But the Dominicans and the Franciscans, who worked more with the poor Chinese in, in poor rural areas, um, they believed that these ancestor rites did amount to worship and that Chinese had to give them up if they wanted to become Christians. So this became a huge controversy between the Jesuits and, and, and the other orders. And the Emperor Kangxi 
uh, was very unhappy that these Catholic missionaries were disagreeing with each other, and he ret retracted his support for the Catholic faith and basically said the only Catholic missionaries that get to stay here are the ones who are taking Matteo Ricci's approach. All the others have to go. And so that was called the rights controversy, the Chinese rights controversy. And it, it lasted for decades, if not a whole century. And eventually the Pope suppressed the Jesuit order entirely across the world, uh, largely stemming from this controversy and possibly other similar ones in other, in other cultures. Um, but it was a huge setback for the missionary efforts of the church which really didn't return to China again for another hundred plus years. Um, in then at the end of the um, end of the uh, 19th century, uh, 1898 to 19, or 1900, um, a, a popular uprising that was uh, opposed to all foreigners, especially Christians, called the Boxer Uprising. Yihotuan took place in China, and approximately 30,000 Christians uh, are, were massacred during an uprising against foreigners and especially Chinese converts to Christianity. It was the most, uh, oh, the most intense area of anti-Christian persecution occurred in Shanxi province under the orders of the local governor, Yu Xian, and there's a picture of him uh, in there too. And so uh, the Boxer Uprising, yeah, it was a terrible, terrible time. It, it, it arose historically it, largely in response to uh, Western countries, especially Great Britain, that had conquered China twice during the, um, during the 19th century in two wars called the Opium Wars. And so that, that, those wars resulted in great humiliation for China. And, and so this anti-foreigner attack uh, was especially um, uh, in response to that uh, kind of what they call the century of humiliation and especially targeted at Christians. So there was a lot of anti-Christian propaganda, a lot of false accusations made against Christians, uh, and, and then it erupted into this violence, which was supported by the Empress at the time, Empress Dowager Tsushi. So it was a very dark time in East-West history as well as in missionary history. Um, in 19... Uh, 26, uh, as China's missionaries, uh, China's missionary, so missionaries, Catholic missionaries from the West returned to China. And by that time, by the early 20th century, a lot of Protestant missionaries were also in China, kind of operating side by side. Um, but the um, Catholic hierarchy in Rome, and especially, or sorry, the Catholic, the Catholic leaders of the different orders that were most active in China, uh, the French and the Germans and some other orders were reluctant to ordain Chinese as bishops. Um, and then in 1926, uh, as China's missionary bishops would not agree to consecrate Chinese bishops, uh, Pope Pius XI invited six Chinese priests to Rome and ordained them himself in St. Peter's Basilica. And then additional vicariates were created in China that were administered by these Chinese bishops and Chinese clergy. So this was a big step forward for the indigenization of the church, the first wave of six Chinese bishops. Yeah, so this is, yeah, this is kind of what the, the, the boxers looked like. They were poor peasants. The long, the long uh, tails of hair that they wear, that was the queue, it's called the queue, that was the required hairstyle uh, during the Qing dynasty. Qing dynasty lasted from the middle, middle of the 1600s until the early 1900s, 1911, 1912 is when it fell. So, um, so that's who these, these folks were. Uh, poor peasants, they, they were called boxers because they believed they did a kind of Tai Chi um, martial arts and they believed that they were um, immune to being injured by bullets, but Unfortunately, that turned out not to be true. Um, and so then moving forward in 1926, these missionary bishops uh, were, or, or these Chinese bishops were ordained. Um, one particularly famous uh, European missionary named Father Vincent Leb, 
I believe he was Belgian. He was a, a Western missionary who went to China and really immersed himself in Chinese culture, became a Chinese citizen, dressed as a Chinese, learned Chinese language, and, and really pushed the church to uh, ordain Chinese priests and make the church as much as possible uh, become, become Chinese. Um, and he's still very beloved by, um, by Chinese today. Uh, I know a, I just met a sister. I'm here at Notre Dame now. I just met a Chinese sister who's yesterday who's here at Notre Dame, and she belongs to a religious order, the, I, the uh, Sisters of St. Therese, who um, were founded by Vincent Leb in the 1920s or 30s. And so very influential figure in history. Um, so let's move ahead to 1949 when the Communist Party takes over. And there's a slide of Chairman Mao Zedong. Um, you've all probably heard of him. He, he was the communist leader. They routed the Nationalist Party and took over China in 1949. And then from uh, 1950 to 1955, all foreign missionaries and non-Chinese Christian teachers were systematically exiled from China. Catholic nuns and priests were forced to leave China and many were arrested as ideological saboteurs. Uh, a couple of particular uh, persons from this era I want to mention is uh, in that the Bishop of Shanghai, Ignatius Gongping Mei. He was um, the first Chinese bishop to serve in Shanghai, and not, not many years, there was a particularly vicious attack by the communists against the, against the church in Shanghai. The church in Shanghai was very strong at that point. That was where uh, Paul Xu Guangqi, the original convert of Ricci, where his family had established a Catholic village and Catholic uh, schools and libraries, which are still there today. Bishop Gong was the first Chinese uh, bishop of Shanghai, as I mentioned. And not long after he was ordained, he was attacked. And, and the 50, 1950s were a time when the Communist Party were attacking people of all religions, but Christians were attacked especially hard. And there's a story, and, and so Bishop Gong was imprisoned along with, a more, I think, more than a thousand other Chinese, yeah, more than a thousand Catholics, um, and other bishops from uh, Taizhou, Hankou, Guangzhou, and Baoding, those are other cities in China, were all imprisoned. And, and Bishop Gong stayed in prison for 30 years. Well, and, and they would bring them out, uh, especially during the 1960s, the time of the Cultural Revolution, and try to get them to publicly renounce their faith. And Bishop Gong was brought out several times into these sessions, which were called struggle sessions. And they would bring them before a big crowd of people, and they would demand Bishop Gong to renounce the Pope. And Bishop Gong said, if I denounce the Pope, I would not only not be a Catholic, I would not even be a Christian. You can cut off my head, but you can never force me to shirk my responsibilities. And the crowd of cat, they brought a crowd of Catholics there because they wanted all these Catholics to see him renounce the faith as an example that they should all do it too. And they all started cheering, long live Christ the King, long live Bishop Gong. And they, you know, just made him disappear again and back to prison. He, but he never uh, recanted or denounced his faith. And he became the first uh, de facto underground bishop. And so the Catholic, all the Catholics who refused to uh, refused to denounce the Pope, refused to register with the government, um, became the underground church. And those clergy who who decided that they had to compromise or or to accept the government's demands and register with the government and to kind of separate themselves from the Pope they became the above ground or official or registered church um, or, or, well, yeah, the registered church. Uh, and in 1957, the Communist Party established uh, an organization called the Chinese Catholic Patriotic Association, which was the government body that was charged with managing the affairs of the Catholic Church in China independently from Rome. And so it's this organization, the, the Patriotic Association, that is really the big problem uh, for this whole era and even up to today. Um, this, this body currently 
uh, well, in, I'm getting ahead of myself, but in 2018, the, this uh, patriotic association was put explicitly under the authority of the Communist Party and not merely under the authority of the government per se. And that changed the, uh, the, the, the degree or the type of influence that the party has over that. But I'm gonna talk about more about that next time. Um, so Bishop Gong successfully resisted. Another priest who was martyred at this time in the 1950s and 1951, I think is uh, Zhang Bei uh, Da Chang. And there's a picture of him there. Um, a great, great beloved hero of the church in Shanghai during that time. So he was let under 50 years old, deeply, deeply beloved by young people. He was a teacher. He taught uh, students, I think in a, in a college. Um, he was a, one of the leaders of the Legion of Mary. They particularly targeted the Legion of Mary because Legion sounds like a military title. And they thought that this was a, you know, a group that could violently resist the government. Um, so, so Beta Chang was the first, I believe the first uh, Catholic priest murdered by the communists. Uh, at least he was the first in Shanghai. And, um, and initially in the 1950s, the, the, Pope, resp the, the Pope responded uh, very clearly against the Patriotic Association, condemned the CCPA, um, and, and so, and declared bishops who participated in consecrating new bishops selected by the CCPA to be excommunicated. And so um, then the Cultural Revolution came from 1966 to 1976, um, when, when the highest persecution against uh, Catholics and all Christians and all religious people, including Muslims and Buddhists and Confucians and just about anybody who was perceived as having Western ideas was persecuted by Mao Zedong. Um, he viciously persecuted just about anybody who he perceived could become a threat to him. Um, but as I already said, Christians got got it especially harsh. Um, Pope John Paul II in the year 2000 canonized 120 martyrs of China. And he did this on October 1st, which is China's national day, which made the Chinese government very angry. But it is also, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the feast day of uh, St. Therese of Lisieux, the patroness of missions. So he said that's the reason he did it on that day. Um, but this is an image of, uh, of those martyr saints. So it includes um, Western missionaries and Chinese people, Chinese martyrs. Um, and there, many of their stories are, to are told, some of them not much, uh, for some of them not that much is known about them, but the, some of their stories are known and, and can be researched uh, if you want to look into that uh, more deeply. So let's go into the next part, which is a little bit more about evangelization and strategies of evangelization. Ricci and the Jesuits and the, er, the missionaries I've already mentioned, you know, without, without using the name enculturation, they were doing what the church now refers to as enculturation, uh, asking the question, how can the Catholic faith um, make connections with, with elements that are already present in Chinese culture? And there are many, many ways that the faith can do that. Um, in the 20th century, one of the Chinese uh, Catholic scholars who did a magnificent job of this is John C.H. Wu. And I'll just go through a little bit, uh, a few, uh, an example of his uh, translation of the Bible. Um, so it, he was uh, born in 1899 in Ningbo, in Zhejiang province, died in 1986 in Taiwan. Um, he became a scholar of law. He studied at, in the U.S. at University of Michigan, then went back to China and drafted the constitution for, for the Republic of China under the president, Jiang Kai-shek. And then Jiang Kai-shek, and, and then uh, Wu became a cap, Wu had become a Protestant when he was a teenager uh, in China, and then fell away from his faith in the intervening years, and then uh, had a dramatic conversion to the Catholic faith in 1937. And, and that story, if you want to read a great biography, autobiography of a Catholic convert, people have referred to him as the Chinese Chesterton. His conversion story also has, has parallels to St. Augustine. 
Um, he lived, he was living a very dissolute life. He was a very successful lawyer, had lots of money, had lot, had, uh, was, was going around to basically prostitute houses and wanted to take a prostitute as a concubine. And his wife with whom he had 13 children said, when you turn 40, you can have, you can have a girlfriend. And then he converted, right? But he, he was converted, convicted and converted and repented right before his 40th birthday. So his autobiography is called Beyond East and West. So that's another book you can, you can put in the notes if there are notes, sorry. Okay, so John C.H. Wu, uh, there's a picture of him of sitting next to Chiang Kai-shek. And so Chiang Kai-shek was the president of China. He had converted to Protestant Christianity in order to marry his second wife, Song Mei Ling, who came from a very famous Christian family. Uh, in 1940, Song Mei Ling and Jiang Kai-shek wanted a Bible translation that really sounded Chinese, um, culturally, uh, in Chinese flavor. They said in this quote, how, how much more powerful the Bible could be as an agent to enlighten men's hearts and minds if a really clear and readable translation could be had. So they were not satisfied with any translations to that point. And John C.H. Wu produced a classical Chinese translation that drew heavily from the Chinese classics. So throughout the translation, there are terms borrowed from the Confucian classics, uh, the Lun Yu and the Tao Te Ching and the Yi Jing and all throughout the Chinese classics. He uses well over 300 terms and not only the terms, but the style he uses. He, he translates, for example, the Magnificat and the Benedictus and the whole book of Psalms into um, classical style Chinese poetry that is right, it rhymes, it's beautiful, it's filled with, um, yeah, it's filled with um, terms from the classics. And so these are the four kind of primary characteristics that it has. Uh, and so it uses four character phrases, an elevated poetic classical style, and, and number three I just mentioned, and authoritative speech. So, for example, when, when, when Jesus is speaking in this version, he uses four character authoritative poetic phrases in the same way that the ancient kings would speak in Chinese classical literature. Um, and so the next slide, I've pulled up just a few examples from the Gospel of John. Um, this is uh, John's prologue, John chapter one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. This prologue is often seen as Wu's uh, greatest achievement in this translation. So I'll just read you a little bit of Chinese here and talk about the word Tao. Tai chu you Dao, yu tian zhu xie, Dao ji tian zhu. And then um, uh, zi shi yu xie, verse two. So the characters I put in red, that's the word Dao. The Chinese, the great word that's that's uh, Taoism, the Tao or the Tao, the way it has a deep meaning in Chinese. It's it's the underlying principle uh, that underlies all things. And so on the next slide, I think it's John 114, which talks about the uh, the incarnation. So uh, we all know John 114 and the word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. We've beheld his glory. Wu translates this as uh, and so uh, the third line I'll skip the fourth line uh, so the line in red is the Tao became a human person that's how Wu translates, and the word became flesh. So he calls Jesus, the incarnate Jesus, the son of God, he calls him the Tao. Um, and that's, you could say that's similar to John the Evangelist in the gospel, using the Greek word logos to describe Jesus as the Tao. He's borrowing a term that was already in the culture, because the Greek word Tao did not mean Jesus Christ before John the Evangelist wrote it that way and uh, in a sense gave it a new meaning. So Wu is using Tao. Other Bible translators had also used Tao before John Wu did, but his was the first Catholic translation to use the term Tao. And even to this day, there's not total agreement among, among scholars and among Catholics about whether or not Tao is a proper term to use. 
It's an argument that I think might never be resolved, um, but I think it's a good term. And I think there's probably, there's no, I, I don't, I'm not aware of any other single word in Chinese that is a better one. So some of the meanings of Tao actually uh, do match and correspond with logos and with the, the presentation of Christ in the gospels. Uh, other meanings of Tao are less close. Um, so John Wu explains in his in his Bible in a note, you know, kind of what he means by that. And then uh, and then the next line in that Gospel of John quote, Kong De Zhirong, that's a quote directly from the Tao Te Ching, uh, written by uh, Lao Tzu, and that's a classic that all all educated Chinese are familiar with. And then in the final line there, it said Miao Chong Zhen Di, the the part that's in yellow, um, the term Zhen Di. Uh, the third and fourth Chinese character that you see, that's a Buddhist term that means ultimate truth. It means the truth that kind of underlies all, all the other truths or the, the ultimate truth that, that underlies, um, you know, the, any, uh, anything that's apparent on the surface. So Wu made very conscious choices to borrow terms that were already familiar to his Chinese readers. I'll finish with this example. Another explicit way that John Wu borrowed from Confucius is from the Analects of Confucius. So the Chinese text is at the top. The English translation is, now this is a very famous uh, quotation from Confucius that all educated Chinese people would be familiar with. The master said, that's Confucius, at 15, my heart was set on learning. At 30, I stood firm. At 40, I had no more doubts. At 50, I knew the mandate of heaven. At 60, my ear was obedient. And at 70, I could follow my heart's desire without transgressing the norm. In other words, after a lifetime of listening to the will of heaven, finally by age 70, my will was aligned with the will of heaven enough that I can follow my own will and, and I won't transgress heaven's commands. So this Chinese phrase at the top you see is I've put in red the pronunciation xin suo yu, which literally means to follow what the heart desires. So the next slide shows how John Wu uses this in John chapter five. For as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the son gives life to whom he will. John 5.21. Gai zheng ru fu zhi, xi, xi si huo ren, zi yi xin suo yu. Our fu ren yi sheng ming. So, um, so Jesus is using the words of Confucius to express his own will being united with the will of the Father. So that's a very conscious way that John Wu wants Chinese people to see this concept from Confucius also is, is present in the Gospels. So these are some of my thoughts on the enduring value of John Wu's version. It has timeless beauty. It helps to preserve Chinese culture and to present the truth and wisdom of China's humanistic tradition. So um, John Wu wrote another book, if you are interested enough in these topics, a book of essays of his called Chinese Humanism and Christian Spirituality. And he, he, he goes through the teachings of Confucianism and of Taoism and talks about ways that they have similar connecting points with the gospels. One of the most delightful essays in there is called St. Therese and Lao Tzu, a study in comparative mysticism. Uh, he loved St. Therese of Lisieux. He actually converted to the Catholic faith after he read St. Therese, a uh, story of a soul. And he felt that she was very Chinese and very close to the spirit of Lao Tzu because she, all of her teaching is a, the little way, humbling oneself, becoming as humble as possible. And that humility is the virtue that is the most, um, the most praised and most uh, taught in the Tao Te Ching of Lao Tzu. And so John Wu wrote a lot about the, the similarities that he found there. So that's an example of enculturation through the translation of scripture. There are many other examples of enculturation through art, for example. There's a whole tradition of Chinese, Christian, and Catholic art. Um, I had one image in the slideshow. It somehow got dropped out by an artist named He Qi, um, who took beautiful, colorful Chinese folk art images. He still does today. He's still working today. Um, and takes Bible stories and puts them into a Chinese folk art style in a beautiful, striking way. So if you want to look that up, his name is He Qi, H-E is his family name, Q-I, H-E-Q. 
Q-I, Hechi. You can look him up online and his images are wonderful. Um, so I will slow down and stop there. And I you know, can give you a million more quotations from all these things, but I'm gonna stop there and let you ask some questions. Thank you for your patient attention. Let's let's start with this one, kind of going back to those early missionaries. This question, uh, this questioner asks, regarding the terms for God, was there disagreement only on God the Father? You mentioned a couple of different terms. Um, what about the Trinitarian names for um, the Son and the Holy Spirit? Was there similar debate? Um, I think that there was... Uh, nowhere near the debate for those for the Son and the Holy Spirit uh, as there was for uh, God the Father. The Son is pretty easy because this, the Chinese word for Son is simply zi or er zi, so that's uh, that's not controversial. Um, the Holy Spirit. There were different words for the Holy Spirit. Um, one that has been one that's currently used most often for Catholics is called Sheng Shen, literally the Holy Deity um, or the Holy Spirit. Um, John Wu created uh, a term that I think was original to him, which was, uh, I think the term is Bao Wei, unsure. Well, that's the term he used to translate the part where Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as the comforter. John Wu calls him basically the, 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 um, the, the comforting teacher or the protecting teacher. Um, so to my knowledge, there isn't the same controversy to give a short-ish answer to the question. Thank you. Uh, Juan Luis here on screen, go ahead and unmute yourself uh, and go ahead with your question. Uh, my question is uh, kind of personal because uh, my wife is Chinese and for the longest I've been trying to convert her. She's mm -hmm. non-Christian. Even though my daughter is 19, she is Catholic. My daughter is Catholic, but my wife hasn't really made the transition. And what I want to know is about books. I've been trying to get a good book that she can kind of open her heart to, um, you know, to be more open to, Christ uh, to Christianity. Sure. Um, if she's open to reading a book on, on the topic, um, I do recommend the two books by John Wu that I mentioned, um, his autobiography, and if she, and that book is available in both English and Chinese. He originally wrote it in English, but it has been translated into Chinese in in both mainland China and Hong Kong. So I don't know if she reads English better than Chinese, but she could get it either way. Yeah, and then. Um, uh, some of his essays it depends on it you know it kind of depends on what your wife's questions are and what she's open to if she's open to reading books like that um you could introduce her to other chinese catholics if you if you find them um and they they're they have materials online there are chinese catholic parishes um who have materials online and you could find them and they have uh videos and materials in chinese if that would be helpful are those books in Cantonese? Because she prefers Cantonese. Oh, the written form is the same. So Chinese written form uh, doesn't matter, Cantonese or Mandarin. She keeps telling me it's different. I don't know. <laughs> <Nope>. um, <laughs> but let, let her take a look and, and decide. And decide, yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Excellent. Yeah, that's great. And, and doctor, if you want to send me uh, links to with, with at first the names, but even links, if you have them to these books that you've been mentoring from from Wu and others, I can include them in the follow up email tomorrow as resources. So, uh, so we can get them out to folks that looking for them, because we've had a couple of questions coming in, uh, kind of looking for a bibliography of sorts for this talk as well for further study. So that would be very helpful to them. Uh, let's take another question. This one from Joan, she's asking, uh, if you could clarify the dispute between the Jesuits and the Franciscans uh, and the Dominicans. I, I think this is this came in when you were talking about the rights controversy. So according to uh, Catholic theology, who was right is her question. The Pope in the, uh, the Pope initially, as I said, suppressed the Jesuits. He basically sided with the Franciscans and Dominicans at the time. However, that the the 
church's understanding of that or judgment about that question changed over, over time. And so by the 20th century, I believe it was the 1930s, uh, the Pope then actually um, declared that the Chinese rites were permissible and that the Jesuit position initially was, uh, was supported or was okay, and that Chinese could, um, could practice those ancestor uh, veneration rituals, rites, and, and that it was okay. It was not in conflict with Catholic teaching. And, and actually, um, in I'm not sure when this practice started, but uh, Catholic, some uh, Catholic outreaches among Chinese actually include some ancestor rites, um, I, not within the mass, but I think outside of the mass as an acceptable practice. practice. So the church today accepts uh, the Chinese ancestor veneration, but I don't, I don't know that that many Chinese Catholics today, um, well, uh, veneration and respect for the ancestors will is always important, but. Uh, since the Communist Party also suppressed ancestor veneration throughout, for everybody throughout China, um, a lot of the secularization of China took place under this kind of enforced atheism. And so a lot of Chinese uh, throughout China still have uh, some practice probably of ancestor veneration. Um, but I think uh, in the West, probably not as many Chinese Catholics practice that, but some do. Sure, sure, thank you. Uh, Father Theodore, go ahead, here on screen. Yes, Professor John. Um, you mentioned those three um, missionary uh, activities that you have mentioned in the 700s, then the 12s, and the 15, then the modern ones. Are those just uh, the only three that we have historical evidence for? Uh, are there any from the Eastern churches? Because you think there's still another 300 years or so uh, from the 700s, uh, from the historians in the Eastern Church, are there other mentions of uh, other Eastern churches coming in? Um, I guess later on we call them Orthodox. Um, yeah. Or, or are they just, uh, those are the only ones that you want to refer to because we're talking about Catholic, or, or are there just other, uh, or there aren't any other historical mentions than the ones that, uh, that you mentioned? Thank you. Yes, thanks for the question. There are other historical mentions of the Eastern churches. And in fact, um, in my notes here, I found that, or in my, in my research here, I, it says what I found, I didn't have time to look into this deeply, but I did find mention that uh, during the time of the Franciscans in that mission in the 12, starting in the 12, 1300s, that there, were, uh, there was another wave of Eastern missionaries there at that time. And so there was, in a sense, some, com some competing missions going on during that time. And then there were later other Eastern Orthodox missionaries that went to China at different times. And I don't have the details on most of those, but we know they were there because um, there are Eastern Orthodox icons of Chinese martyrs, especially from that Boxer Rebellion time period. Um, and there's a beautiful image. I didn't get it into the, to the presentation, but you can look online for Eastern Orthodox Chinese martyrs and you'll find uh, a beautiful Eastern style icon of, of those martyrs. Um, so that's a history that is there. Uh, there, were, there were not very many. The Eastern Orthodox Church didn't become, never became very big, but they definitely, it definitely had a presence and still has a presence today. And the influence from Russian Orthodox into China um, is a presence also. Mm -hmm. So there really wasn't much of the gap from the Nestorians up until the time of the Franciscans is just a lack of historical uh, data. We don't know if there were uh, other others that may have come in. Just nothing really uh, seeded itself. Nothing really gave root until until the Franciscans came in, and then the following Jesuits. Um, as I think that it's simply um, judging by the historical record. So um, it might be po it's possible that that others came, and there just isn't is not a historical record of it. Um, that's that's um, that's not an area I've looked into deeply enough. So you might research that yourself and find out more, and that would be a fascinating topic to look into. I would not be surprised if there's some mention or evidence of of more Eastern missionaries during that intervening time. But if the if the 
given that it was officially forbidden by the emperor, it's also possible that, that more missionaries tried to go and simply couldn't get in. Doctor, could you close us in prayer this evening? Sure. Um, let's offer a special prayer for the church in China, our brothers and sisters, our wonderful brothers and sisters in China, especially those who, who are suffering in various ways. Um, May 24th is uh, the, the um, day of prayer for the church in China established by Pope Benedict XVI. So why don't we pray uh, maybe a Hail Mary and glory be to the Father for the church in China and for all of you and for us and our families. Uh, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen.